Hello, FMA Pulse community. Thank you for joining us today as we have a discussion with Romeo Macapagal. Mung Romi, as he is known by his friends and students, is one of the few remaining authorities on Kali's Illustrissimo as taught directly by the late Grandmaster Antonio Tatang Illustrissimo. Mung Romi began his training with Tatang in 1986, and as the appointed archivist, his life work is to preserve the Kali's Illustrissimo system in its purity. Mung Romi, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, having this discussion uh, with us. So um, starting out, can you tell us about yourself, your background? Well, uh, I'm a, uh, what do you call this? I'm a kind of a jack of all trades nerd, but not nerd in the computer kind of nerd. This is more a nerd of old knowledge of uh, physical knowledge, the practical knowledge that's what, that was needed to be able to cope with the environment 74 years ago because it was just the end of wartime Manila. It was the beginning of the period of reconstruction in Manila. Uh, when I was maybe six, seven years old, I could stand at the train station and see almost clear across Manila, except for a few buildings that were left standing. So my upbringing was that of being a practical person. Although they tried, my, my parents tried to send me to uh, good schools, but it had to be a practical approach to life. And I have retained this practicality. Okay. I first saw my grandfather uh, move a little with the stick and I had to stand on a stool for him to be able to teach me a few movements. But <clears throat> my grandfather was very old. So there was not enough time to really teach me his arnis. When he died, when I was maybe 19 or so, no, maybe 22, I still had not learned enough from him because, of course, as I was getting stronger, he was getting weaker. Um, I tried to look for other Arnis instruction uh, in my environment, in the Metro Manila area and in the provinces around it. I saw movements that were similar to my grandfather's, but uh, they were not executed with the same uh, precision as I saw, as I remembered. Until uh, finally, at about age 45 or 46, uh, I met Tatang in Luneta. I saw him at a distance, I saw him making movements that were exact movements of what my grandfather had been teaching me. So I approached him and asked for instruction. And he readily said yes. Uh, and it started uh, some of the most wonderful times of my life. Uh, Tatang had this. Uh, very keen way of looking at people. He was always measuring people's intent around him. He was, until he got comfortable with someone, then he would always be measuring people. Someone's coming at him from a distance, at 15 meters, Tatang would be on high alert. And he would not relax until he was sure that this person uh, was essentially harmless. But he never completely relaxed. It was the kind of weariness that I had seen in uh, people who had killed and who were still out of jail. And uh, I was familiar with this because where I grew up, uh, uh, fights were common. Within the week, uh, 
there would be at least two or three fights. We call them vaudevilles, the Philippine pronunciation of vaudeville, a play, a drama. Okay, and uh, it was not unusual for me to deal and see these people. There was a basketball court. It had become popular already. In the, in the basketball court, there was always two pairs of gloves hanging. If people did not agree, then the elders would say, okay, box it out. They'd put the, they'd put the gloves on us and uh, we would fight and have it out. But this was a gentlemanly approach. The more so common, no, no weapons involved yet? No, not yet. That's why the more common is if you really felt that you got aggrieved, then you took a coke bottle and waited for the guy and hit him over the head with it. So it was a violent environment. Manila had become a melting pot of various uh, Philippine tribes coming in to look for work, coming in to look for chances in life because it was right after the war. And uh, uh, it was very, very common for uh, a fight to happen or they would even go around announcing, hey, we're going to have a fight later to tonight. Uh, please give contributions for uh, mercurochrome. No iodine yet at that time. Bandages and then something for uh, merienda. Como se llama merienda? Uh, snacks. Okay. So uh, it was common. Violence was common. You accepted it. You expected it. Uh, in the kind of Manila I was growing up in. Uh, and then. Uh, as the city prospered, uh, there were less and less uh, violent uh, altercations, less and less fights uh, would happen, uh, maybe once a week or twice a week, no longer the almost every night. Uh, Mang Romy, were these fights mainly one-on-one uh, -on -one or was it gang, gang fights? Uh, most of these were gang wars. A tribe would not see eye to eye with another tribe, but they live in the same general community. And then they would have it out with each other. And they would have back and forth fights. One side would run off and hide. Then the other side would retire to their, uh, the attacking side would retire to their bastion. Then they would be attacked by the guys that ran away. And it would go on maybe... Maybe three or four... Sometimes even five times a night. Oh, wow. Okay. So everybody would, because this was a narrow street that we had. These were squatter settlements. And the narrow streets would accommodate maybe one and a half cars. And everybody's door and window would be shut while they're peeking through holes at the fight. Watching. Because sometimes some of the gang members might run into your house for shelter and the rest would come in and try to uh, kill him. So this was the kind of situation that I grew up in. Later on, uh, we transferred to a more peaceful area, but there would still be fights. Uh, the Filipino is hot-headed. And uh, we are emotional. What would cause these fights, Mang Romy? An insult. Somebody looks at you. Just anyway. Somebody looks at you hard and you ask him, why are you looking at me that way? You want to fight? And a fight would uh, come out unless the guy backs off. What do you think you're doing? Are you measuring me? You want to kill me? It was always that way. Especially if you were with a girl. Why are you looking at my girl like that? You are bastos. It's bastos. Ah. Yes. Bastos means uh, impolite. Rude. And you felt uh, uh, a need to defend your girl's honor. 
So it's better now. It's 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 almost like America now. Okay, but not really. Uh, people don't don't go fight because of these things anymore. For other things, uh, it's gotten a lot more and uh, more peaceful. Anyway, that's the kind of environment I grew up in, and that's why I am always alert and careful, very wary of fights. Uh, because the fight can embroil you even if you are not part of it. Just being a bystander can get you knife. In an altercation between two people, one of the bystanders might decide he wants to come in also. He delivers a kick, he delivers a punch, and when he gets very excited, he pulls out a knife and stabs anyone, either of the protagonists, uh, they will just stop. So you don't want to get into the ground. Here. Anyway, so that was it. And then I moved out uh, into more uh, peaceful surroundings. And I got work uh, in various trades. I, I became a banker. And I also became a construction man. I was into civil construction and into shipbuilding. Uh, so I had a kind of formal background. And that's why when I met Tatang, we, Tony Diego and I spent three and a half years studying his system. And I had the ability to, to put his system into a form of manual, where it was carefully described, carefully recorded, uh, because I was told by one of the most respected martial artists of my generation. He was uh, Johnny Chuten, the late, great Johnny Chuten. And uh, when he came and visited us uh, practicing with Tatang, uh, he said, uh, Romy, come here. I said, yes, Mano. Make sure you preserve this system. This is the most unique system of Arnis or of fighting that I have ever seen. And, you know, before, uh, your seniors in the martial arts were like gods. Their orders were like orders from heaven. You made sure that you accomplished their orders. Manung Jani was older by me than by about almost 10 years. Uh, he was a Kung Fu man and he turned into Arnis and uh, he was very respected because in university he was waylaid by about 16 frat men and at the end of maybe five or six minutes all of the 16 frat men were on the ground or were running away against one man. That's why Johnny Chuten was like a god. <laughs> uh, so um, I recorded, and my life work has been to preserve the Kalis Illustrissimo system. It is so unique because it is against all of the other armies that you've ever watched on any video. It is very methodical. It is very systematic. It is very efficient. There is no superfluous movement of the sword or of the stick. There is no superfluous movement of the foot or of the arm or of the hands. Everything is devoted to ending the fight immediately. Sometimes you cannot even see what he does. And his answer was, you cannot allow anyone to see what you're doing. You don't want your opponent to see what you're doing. Why will you allow a, a bystander to be able to see what you're doing? So after a while, it became poetic. You say, oh, hidden techniques. No, they are not hidden techniques. It's just that people expected flashy techniques. But here were pure and simple uh, 
from an engineering point of view, very efficient movements. No wasted time, no wasted power, no wasted movement. And you went in right away. It was deadly. It was brutal. But because delivered with such elegance and grace, it looked beautiful. This is the reason that I devoted the rest of my life from that first time I met Tatam. I was 36 years old, by the way. Uh, I'm 74 now, to preserving it. I never thought of uh, preserving it by teaching others. I always thought in terms of recording it, documenting it. I did not believe in videos and pictures because a lot is hidden in those videos. But I wanted to make sure that the injunctions of Tata, the small hints, the small, uh, what do you call this, the small uh, instructions were preserved because they define the movements the efficiency of the movement. What is lacking in most of the instructionals I've ever seen is the definition of intent. There is no definition of intent of when you are making your move. They just say, you make a move here, you make a move here, you do this angle, you do this uh, uh, thrust, you do this cut, you do this footwork, but there is no mention of intent. Management is based on fulfilling an intent. You have an objective, then you intend to fulfill that objective. Then you put together the elements necessary to fulfill that objective's intent. So in the end, Everything that you do is based on intent. Your precision, your efficiency, the amount of power that you use, the amount of speed that you use is based on intent because that intent defines the principles, the physical uh, movements that you will be doing and the way that you deal psychologically with your opponent. So, Mang Romi, how does one develop the intent. You need to know what you want to do. And many people don't know what they want to do. They just want to go through the motion. This looks good. This is fancy, flashy. Your intent is to disable your opponent as soon as possible before he can disable you. All of your being goes into that single purpose, that single intention. Disable him, stop him from harming you. In the old days, it meant killing. Maybe with skill, you can get by with uh, breaking his arm. But many people, especially Philippines, Filipinos, a broken arm does not mean that he's going to stop. So you'll have to knock him on the head. And sometimes knocking him on the head ends his life. There has been too much fantasy involved in all of this because it's a civilized world. People uh, have a disgust for violence and for things that cause death, although they're moving uh, theoretically in ways that will cause death or injury, serious injury. So, a lot is lost. We've heard stories of uh, training back home in the Philippines, how, you just call it brutal? Yeah, because uh, the stories that we've heard that there was no training blades, uh, uh, and if they train, they use the real blade. Is that true? Uh, okay. Uh, in the old days, my time, in my youth, uh, you went to an Eskrima instructor, Arnis instructor. He was not called an instructor. He was called 
mang something. And he was reputed to be good with the stick or with the pen. There is a period of training where he will use a stick. You will use sticks. And then there's a period of training where you will use blunts. And remember, the Philippines is a poor country. A blade is very expensive according to our income capability. So it was very rare for a blade to be blunted to be used for training. Eventually, the training involved uh, what they call this is sparring. If you've seen a banana leaf, there's a midrib, which is about an inch and a half at the base and, and perhaps uh, an inch at the end. And this is used to spar with. This teaches you not to block with your stick. This teaches you to parry with the hand on the hand. This teaches you to move away from the strike. And yet, at the end of the sparring session, we are called green. Because the midrib will splatter and it is fresh and it's colored green. So we become green. And of course, we have hematoma under the green. This is the kind of training that was used here in Luzon. Okay. In the Visayas, they did not resort to banana leaves, mid, mid, mid ribs. They just used uh, yanto. It was more painful. Uh, and then later on, there is a procedure, at least here in Luzon, called paglilinis. Paglilinis means uh, the cleaning up. The master, the teacher, the mama, uses a real sharp sword. He gives his student a blunted sword and he feeds at one third, one half, and then three fourths speed and decides while doing all of this whether his student is already able to perform the proper movements of the blade, whether he uses the back, the edge, the flat in parrying, how he is able to get out and how he's able to get the hand, the sword hand. And uh, after a while, then if, if the student has become like a son, then he will hand a live blade and they will go at it, but only at up speed. Very few were able to do this. Uh, very few uh, have ever gone through this. So when they say, oh, we use light blades. Oh, yeah? Stories. Stories from their grandfathers. I doubt that anyone ever played or they saw anyone ever played with real life plays. In demonstration, yes, muestra, to make sure that you understand the angle, the distance, the measure, the pressure, but this is at half speed, half pressure. So, but playing with blunts, I think a few are starting to do that now, but they go cling, clang, cling, clang. Of course, that's useless. You go head to head with somebody's sword and you'll probably lose your head. Hmm. So, so Henry, yeah. So what did it take to uh, become a student under Tatang? Did he take anybody or did you have to like prove yourself or? Uh, it was very easy because Tatang, by the time I met him, had already been going to Luneta for at least five years. He had adapted himself to the culture of people coming in casually. Tang, can you teach me? He said, okay, I can teach you. So he gives him a few techniques, a few tricks, enough for him to preserve himself. If he should find himself in an empty street with guys coming at him, and if he had a weapon. Typically here, we didn't use Rattan to carry around. 
we tried to get our hands on bahi or or tamagong the hard one so the most expedient was a half inch uh, water pipe you can imagine what a half inch water pipe can do on your forearm oh yeah or or on your noggin mm -hmm. huh? yes that's the way it was that's the way it can still be sometimes so with Tatang, people would come to him. Tatang, how much will it cost to teach me? Say 10,000 pesos. I'm sorry, Tatang, I only have 100 pesos here. That's okay. He didn't care about money. And he didn't care if you learned or not. If you made a mistake, he wouldn't correct you. If he you ask him, Tatang, I think he you made correct. a mistake. No, he won't correct you. So you learn from your mistakes, basically. Yes. And if you realize that you made a mistake, then you ask him, Tatang, I think I made a mistake. Uh, can I feed you again? And can you counter again? He said, okay, come at me. But you have to be careful to attack him at the same angle, at the same distance, and at the same speed. Because he would change his reaction according to exactly how you came at him. Then, if you had enough patience, eventually you might learn a few things. It took Tony, Diego, and myself three and a half years to record and define the few techniques of Tatang. Few because there are not too many, really. It's only when people try to invent that they become numerous. There are other techniques, and that's all that's important. Because from the mother techniques, you can derive the permutations during sparring. Okay. Uh, so it was like that with Tata. He didn't care. You. He didn't care that you did it correctly or not. Some people will get angry with me, but I will just point you guys out. If you can review videos concerning Kalis Industrisimo, there is one video where Tata shows a technique specifically. And yet the other students around him do the technique according to their own interpretation of it. Tatang does not mind. You can go kill yourself if you're going to be foolish enough to do that. He didn't care. Why should he involve himself? If you're stupid enough not to understand what he is doing and try to give your own interpretation, then it's your call. Because people like to call themselves, taught by Tatang Illustrissimo, try to call themselves Illustrissimo. But you look at the movements, and the movements are not recognizable as Tatang movements. Because they feel that as long as they call themselves Illustrissimo, they have the magic of the Illustrissimo system. It's not. Because there were definite techniques that are traceable to the Spaniards. There were definite techniques. There are definite techniques that are traceable to his Tausu background. So, there are definite techniques that are traceable to the native type of semi-silat. If you have gone around the Philippines and you've seen enough people, especially in the more remote areas, then you will understand that there is a pattern of movement. And these are contained in the Illustrissimo system, but with an underlying sense of economy, of precision. We call it uh, insurance. You ensure your life by being precise, by having an economy of movements, by making sure that you bring your body part out of the line of the stunt. You don't rush in. Right. So, Mong Romi, how did Tatang develop his system? You know, this economy of motion? Actually, in the research that we have done, along with our friends 
uh, Celestino Makachor and uh, Ned Nakange. Okay? It seems to us that El Padre Capitan Bermejo about uh, 1850s or even earlier decided that it was necessary to protect the island of Cebu and built many bantayans, built many forts. Bantayan Island was one fortress island that was very important. And the Spaniards, Spanish friars, because there were many padre capitans. Padre means a priest. Uh, who undertook the protection of the settlements because the Spanish administrators were too busy trying to make money that they didn't care what happened to the settlements. But the priests wanted to ensure the propagation and uh, uh, the steadiness of the Catholic faith and uh, they uh, tried to teach uh, the natives under their care how to fight off the Moro raiders. So, uh, Bantayan Island seems to have been taught also by P Padre Capitan Bermejo, and uh, there is thus a very strong Spanish flavor in the techniques used by Tatan. He learned from his forebears. He had an uncle named Melesio, very famous. Uh, when we were going around, it turns out that he had gone all the way to Pampanga, at least, from the Visayas in his uh, peregrinations uh, all the way down to the southern part of Mindanao. He was a famous uh, fighter in the sense of a prize fighter. Uh, these prize fighters of Armis would go from town to town for every fiesta because during their times, around the 1900s, the early 1900s, it was common for uh, ascrimadores to behave like prize fighters. You had English prize fighters, right? Boxing. Well, we had ascrimadores here. There was a pot money, people bet on them, and then they fought. Were there then, rules course, there... in these fights? Of that? Were there rules? Oh, yes. Uh, the rule was very simple. You gave up, you lost. <laughs> okay. You got bloodied, typically by a hit on the head, the fight was stopped, you lost. You dropped your stick, you lost. And then you have to make sure that if you went to a home to, to a town and there was a heavy favorite, you decided to lose to him. Because if you won over him, then you wouldn't be able to make it out of the town. You would be ambushed and beaten up or killed. So they would lose on purpose? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, no. No uh, fair play. So were and punches and kicks allowed, or was it only with the stick? It was mostly with the stick, and sometimes they will allow hardwood branches to be used. But uh, was punches allowed? Punching, kicking, anything mm, like that? Actually, in Arnis, you can chop you can punch, but at the speed of engagement, when you're really trying to hit someone, you don't have time to deliver a punch. All you have time for is to parry with your hand, an oncoming attack. But in the Arni systems, there are the use of the knife hand, the thrusting hand, the punch, and the hammer fist. So that was the way it was, and Melesio was a famous prize fighter, and he fought with one foot in a hole on the ground, and with only one, the right foot being able to move around him. 
he was Tatang's idol. Tatang was speaking always of Melesio as a very, very uh, skilled escrimador. He speaks of a time when Melesio was waylaid with spears and he was just catching the spears and putting them on a pile beside him until the ambushers decided to run off when they ran out of spears. Okay. Uh, he drove a nail through his left foot into the wooden floor of his house and then pulled out the nail and dropped it in when he practiced. He poured holy oil on it until it healed with the hole. So he kept the hole in the floor, he kept the hole in his foot, he kept the nail, and he dropped the nail into his left foot every time he practiced. Using only, using only his right foot. And there's a term for it. Walong apak. Walo is eight, apak is steps. Surprisingly, if you go into the Japanese systems, you have a hapogiri. Hapo, eight. Giri, cut. Eight cuts. Circular around. If you go into the Western fencing, there is such a thing as rositas, like a rose, and it also has eight directions. It seems to be universal for serious fighters. You read on Fig, F-I-G-G, -G, one of the more famous uh, British uh, swordsmen, and the uh, tale is told of him that uh, he never moved his back foot, which is the equivalent of nailing the back foot down. The left foot down. So, uh, unusual because Melesio, uh, I think, made a livelihood out of prize fighting and he wanted to make sure that he was that skilled. By the way, he was the idol of Tatang, the model, but he also was taught by his family. There were many brothers of, of his father who taught him. Then he went into Zamboanga and he came across uh, uh, Pedro Cortes, who was supposed to be a friend of his father. And this Pedro Cortes was a, was a bounty hunter. Only two countries in the world still have bounty hunting, the U.S. and the Philippines, where the government puts a price on a criminal and anyone can go after that criminal, dead or alive bring him in during those days it was more expedient to bring the head than the whole person struggling so tatang spent time with this pedro cortez uh, as uh, pedro cortez's assistant but uh, tatang was more interested in the psychical abilities uh, magical abilities of pedro cortez than than his actual fighting prowess because I think Tatang after a while decided that uh, he was skilled enough to be able to handle anyone. So I never heard him speak in awe of Arnis's skills, of someone's Arnis's skills, except that of his uncle Meles. And where did his uncle learn that? Was it past time? Was it a family system? Uh, I think uh, it was a pass or not a family system. Uh, I think uh, it was derived from the uh, mountain tribes that we have here and also influenced by the Spanish system because the Spanish system the European system has eight lines on the ground with a fixed point in the middle. If you look at uh, Italian fencing, it has that. You look at Spanish fencing, it has that. It's always these uh, eight radiating lines from the central point. Uh, and they have beautiful drawings even in, uh, uh, with the Italian, uh, no, with the Italian uh, systems. So I don't think it was a self-development. I think it was an influence from both the Spanish and from the mountain, mountain kind of fighting.
The Philippines is mountainous. It used to rain all the time because of the heavy vegetation. And the ground was always wet and muddy. So the mountain people would fight very low on the ground. They could not afford to be dancing around on the ground like you can on settlements with flat roads. Okay. Uh, so they are crouched low on the ground and they keep on trying to defend their heads and trying to hit the knees. I think between what was taught to the Bantayanon by El Padre Capitan Bermejo and the influence of this uh, mountain style fighting, the Walung Apak was developed or was used rather by uh, Malaysia. It is a very unusual system. Uh, I have taught it to a very few of, of the students who had the uh, perspicacity to go through the rigid training because it puts a hell of a load on your knees. The last time I could do it was three years ago. I can no longer do it. So there you are. If you're talking of exotic uh, approaches, yes, very exotic. But also very, very technical from an engineering point of view. I look at Eskrima, especially Tatang's Eskrima, as applied engineering. Also, uh, like to continue continue on with like the with foreigners trying to learn learn Kali excuse me uh, when foreigners are trying to learn Kali's Lustrisimo, do you find it that uh, when they try to learn it, they're just trying to learn to get a certificate, um, or are they really passionate about learning it? I've come across maybe three people who, at the beginning, really wanted to learn it. But they suffered from the inconvenience of not being residents of the Philippines. They had to stay here for a short while, leave, come back maybe, leave, and uh, they had to cram as much training or learning as they could in a very short while. Okay. I had a very sad experience with one because my injunction was you must video everything that you plan to show people and it must pass my imprimatur. Otherwise, do not show it. After three trips, he decided that he was going to make changes because the pressure on a person to maintain uh, fidelity to the movements is very great. Your instinct tells you you must move this way. But your instinct is not measured from an engineering point of view, and that is dangerous. Your instinct puts you into danger. Therefore, your discipline of maintaining your guard, of maintaining your measure, of maintaining your angle of entry, of moving away from the strike instead of moving into the strike, the pressure to keep those disciplines is too much. And especially when these people are doing it to be able to sell themselves. Because, you know, for show this, for video mileage, oh, you can do all kinds of magic. And they are invited by that need to do uh, permutations that are, I'm sorry to use the word, that are stupid, that can get paid. So you find their feeders pulling back the feed because they will get hit. Okay. Then there was one who did not understand, but tried to pretend that he understood. And the last one, 
uh, who is very serious, admits to not really knowing, and I still guide him. Now, between these three, there were perhaps almost 50 who came and went. And all they wanted was a photo with the old man. I learned Illustrissimo. And then they set up shop. Poor mm. customers. Mm. Mm. So, Mongoli, that, that brings us to the question of um, what are your thoughts on the current state of FMA, how FMA is taught in the Philippines versus how it's taught anywhere else outside the difference uh, yes. <clears throat> um, in the philippines you might still find a few who when they allow themselves to be seen teaching are purists there is one in paeta laguna i will mention his name now his name is Maestro uh, Reynaldo Baldemor. His nickname is Doy. He has to be one of the greatest repositories of technical know-how about dueling arnis. Mm. Is he still alive, Mangumi? He's alive. He's alive. I was with him uh, February this year before the lockdowns. I consider him to be a very special friend. Uh, he is a very formal person uh, and very friendly and very generous. But between my skill and his skill, I'm probably maybe only one half. But you should see the way that he manages measure. You can stand front to front. You strike at him, you will miss him by an inch. He will strike at you and his stick will be six inches behind your head. Repeatedly. That is Eskrima. That is Arnis. Uh, there's another one somewhere in Panay. Uh, he's, he's good, but... Uh, Otherwise, um, and then of course, I, I have a very special friend. I call him Idol. Okay, uh, GM Bobby Tabuada. And he is amazing, not only because of his skill, but because of his ability to teach. He's teaching something that was taught to him. No matter what he says, he developed it or whatever. No, it's still the same movement but his ability to transmit information and to train his students is amazing. Me, I cannot teach. I'm too much of a nerd to teach. But <laughs> That's like me, because Jesse is the, the one that likes to teach and I, I don't know how. Oh. I teach by accident. Yeah. <laughs> we also, yeah. uh, especially Jesse, we study uh, on um, the Tobata system. Yes, yes. His, his system is amazing. Uh, I studied an Australian training method for education. They have this uh, system called the uh, National Competency System. And they have level one until level 12. Level one is how to hold a screwdriver and turn a screw. Level 12 is for someone doing his doctorate. So you can imagine the kind of sophistication in that educational system. And GM Tabuada system will fit into that, I think, all the way to uh, NCS uh, 4 or 5. In terms of transmission, in terms of content uh, delivery, in, ten in terms of checking on, on the performance of 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 how a student learns that's why uh, for me he's my idol of course he's a very good friend um he's very gentle very charming but more than that i really respect the, his uh, 
his uh, skill and his intelligence. So, practically, uh, there are still others, my contemporaries, who are trying to maintain uh, the purity of the older systems. But here is what happened. And let me speak honestly. Americans want everything in a can. Open the can, spoon out the contents into your mouth, and you're done. Okay. Uh, and therefore, uh, America is the biggest market for our needs. Later on, it became Europe, the West. Uh, and our teachers who tried their luck out there were able to perceive the market. And they did exactly what the Japanese did. The Japanese studied the American market and they designed their products to suit American demands. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is exactly what happened to Arnis Astor in America. And this is exactly what has happened to Arnis as practiced here. Because the people here, es escrimadors, are being taught methods and approaches to satisfy the American market. And you're asking me, what is that? It's very simple. I said it earlier. Exercise and entertainment. But there are a very few institutions who think that some of my friends are giving genuine stuff suitable for them. This is GM Bobby. I will not say what he is teaching, to whom, but the serious people talk with him. So we have a gem there. My idol, Bobby Tabwada. <laughs> yes. So do you feel that the FMAs outside of the Philippines are more watered down? And, and also, we always talk about how it's almost becoming too complicated and it's, you know, and it's unpractical. Some of the, the stuff that's being taught. I, I mean, mean, it looks fancy, it looks cool and all this and that, but you know, like practicality wise, it's, no. you know, that can you know get you killed. Uh -uh. He, people over there uh, like to exercise his skills. So they're teaching our niece to, uh, people with uh, brain injuries for their brains to recover through exercise, through complex movements. Okay, that's where it finds its place. But not for a fight on the street or inside your home when you're attacked. Okay, where milliseconds are counted, where your life is on the line, there's very little of the staff out there that will do that. That's why I say, unless you are in the military or in the police mm -hmm. or in work where your life is involved, why learn it except for exercise and for entertainment? For bragging rights to say, oh, I'm learning Arnish, you know? It's Kali. I'm learning Kali. Kali is supposed to be with the blade. But even this is a mistake. Some guy, before I was born, decided he was an educated person. He made his researches and he said, Oh, Kali is the national fighting art of the Philippines. There was no Philippines yet. And Kali is part of a world. In the Malay languages, kali-kali means repeat, repeatedly. In one of our dialects here in Ilongo, kali-kali is arithmetic to add this addition. Okay? Ka is a prefix to a verb. So when you have ka li rongan, it's not Kali as the root word of Kalirongan. Lirongan means 
study, understanding. The act of studying is ka lirungan. And yet, they have tried to fit kali to mean uh, sword play using the edged weapon. So it became kali, arnis, eskrima. Arnis means the harness, A R N E S. Harness in Spanish is a harness on which the armor is attached. There were plays of the Reconquista, the fights between the Moors and the Spaniards towards the end of the Moorish occupation of Spain. And the people, the actors, wore an arnes on which to hang the various pieces of uh, armor that were to be used for the play. So it became known as arnis. Previous to that, it was known by the Spanish word estocada. Estocada means to thrust. It also meant fencing. Escrima is from the word esgrimir. And the root in English is skirmish. Escrima, skirmish, esgrimir. But it's lost because of the, of the hype. People want to coin words, make it sound more dramatic, make it sound more exotic. So the essence is lost. And they want to talk of a native uh, fighting system. <laughs> it's like this. When the, when the Spaniards created settlements along the coast, they had to be protected. So they had to teach the natives how to fight. Naturally, what will they teach? Is Spanish fighting methods. Because previous to that, the conquered people, the ones that were converted to Christianity, converted because of religion, when the Moro raiders came, they flew up to the mountain. They waited until the trade winds changed, and then they came down again. Now, if you were operating an hacienda, a farm, you cannot allow your serves to go up the mountain. You have six months or more where your fields will not be attended to. So they had to teach the Indios, the native population, to fight the Moro. And that's why when it comes to the settlements, you will still find areas where people remember or still instinctively do movements that are recognizable as Spanish, or in this case, Hema. Okay? But in the mountains, they had a different way because of the terrain. Mm -hmm. Okay? And because of less Spanish influence. And then now people are talking of the Moro fighting arts. That is another business altogether. The Moro fighting arts have a different logic system. A fighting art is a logic system. It's a game. And uh, the logic system of the Moro fighting arts, the Tausu, the Maranao, the Bilaan, etc., etc., uh, are different because of the different logic system, a different mental outlook, a different cultural outlook. So when you say, oh, it's like uh, Silat, no, no, what do you know about Silat? See? But they try to sell it. Oh, this is like Silat. I am very sorry, but this is the status of now everything is subsumed into FMA, Filipino martial arts. No. What about the martial arts in the mountains where they still use spears? Okay. So when we say FMA, what we can define with precision will be the Spanish influenced fighting arts, sword arts. But something went wrong. After Philippine independence in 1946, our Filipino patriots decided to take away any thrusting because thrusting was European, was Western. 
So it was all bludgeoning with sticks. These guys didn't hold a bolo in their own life because they came from the illustrado, from the richer classes who were able to go to university. They did not have to chop firewood. They did not have to go and get firewood from the forest. So they never knew how to use the blade. So they started to use the stick, which is effectively the foil. You have fencing? You use a foil to make sure you don't hurt your partner too much. But if it breaks, you kill him. See? So, but here you can use a stick and that stick is not going to hurt too much. Although there are instances where people have died with a stick strike to the head. That was fairly common, right? Among yes. Women. Yeah. So that's that's a general outlook on on these things. Uh, me, uh, I was able to teach two. Eventually, the rationale of my tribe was proven correct. In my tribe, the Kapampangan, you do not teach anyone outside of your bloodline except the son of your best friend. In my case, what came out after 30 plus years is the most loyal, the most satisfactory students who could continue the illustrissimo tradition is the second son of a friend and the third son of a cousin. The others are still trying to prove themselves. And they are very few. There are only another two or three. Because there is a tendency to revise. There is always a, the imagination is so strong uh, that it will cause the mind to look at the permutations and go away from the, from the mother techniques, the principal techniques. Oh, I forgot. Uh, there's a, uh, a third one of the students. He was actually uh, the first. Okay. And yet, what he's doing is on public, he shows another thing. But he has a small core group that I went and taught twice. And after my second trip, they came to me in a group when they were, we had the party. And they asked us, me very respectfully, Mang Romi, do you mind very much because we have come to this agreement and conclusion? I said, uh, please tell me. And they said, is it all right if we do not teach it at all? Is it all right if we just practice it amongst ourselves? And I said, that's exactly what I thought you should really do. Because once you teach it, it becomes what and what. Once it is taught, then it becomes watered down because people cannot understand the intent. It's a different culture. It's a different setting. But these are people involved in activities where their lives are involved. And that is why they spoke that way. Do you mind very much that we will just keep this to ourselves? That we will just practice it amongst ourselves? That made me very happy. So Mung Rumi, there's a, you know, the debate going on about um, how someone can teach stuff like blade fighting if they've never actually ever been in a, in a knife fight or a blade fight. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, okay, it's like this. It's psychological. If you've never been in a real fight where you're desperate to get out alive, you do not know what is needed to bring into the fight. Awareness, stamina, uh, stability, emotional, mental stability. 
your ability to focus okay and your decision to come out alive and leave this guy on the ground without that you will be teaching a theoretical subject matter to people who expect to save their lives because of what you're teaching for me it is criminal uh, there is a there is a term in teaching it is called in loco parentis you are the parent in that setting in that local loco is local in that place where you teach so you must exercise a parent's care and responsibility towards the person that you teach where is that only a sergeant major teaching some of his special forces men has this in loco parentis because he cannot think in terms of in the morning i will have to face your wives and you are no longer around see he has that responsibility so he must teach his men how to survive an attack how to survive a fight when he sends them in so that he can face their wives and his chil and their children and say i did what i needed to do for your your for your father see there is no responsibility like that available commercial nada they have to make a living they have to pay the rent now they have to pay for the webinar or the zoom so where where is the quality where is the personal experience that you can imbue your student with so that when he gets into a firefight when he gets into a knife fight you are able to think that ah he has a 50 50 chance how does Very one how does one develop you know at least some kind of skill or knowledge because most of us you know have never been in a knife fight just you know admittedly but how how can one develop some you know so at least it somewhat prepares you for you know in case that you ever have an encounter like that uh okay we've had simulations we've had simulations where with very little armor except the face mask to avoid injury to the eyes uh we've made students spar uh and uh, in almost all cases it was mutual death mm. if it were with real if life. it was real right if it was real eventually uh we bring in someone who has been in a real fight and over a battle of rum uh he explains what it is so when these guys get into the next spar, they imbibe some of that. So maybe they're able to deliver a three versus two. Still dead, but more dead for the other guy. And then eventually they get this cunningness, this uh, stealthiness, this cheating kind of mindset where he's baiting and uh, he's cheating all the time in illustrissimo we call it engaño okay and it is like a slate of hand it's magic okay you are creating smoke and mirrors in a few seconds one or two seconds then you're able to get your thrust in and you're able to jump out and in a real life situation you're waiting for him to bleed off okay. 
But when they come in with all of this, ah, chang, 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 both will receive mortal wounds. We tried it with paint. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the felt tip? Pentel. Okay. They're red all over. Both. No matter how intelligent, because you cannot put the sense of danger and having to survive. The fight or flee mode. That's why we get a battle of ram and ask this guy or skilled three or four people uh, to talk with the, the students. Where will you get that over there? Even here, they're now becoming less and less available. Mm. They're in prison or they've died or something. Mm. So for me, uh, it's difficult to replicate that. But uh, do you feel uh, by sparring that it, it, it will help in a way to help prepare people for that? I mean, you know, yes, compared to better spar. than nothing. Yes, if you spar hard enough. Mm -hmm. And if the sparring hurts. The sparring has to hurt. Don't over armor. Just preserve the ice. Right. I agree. Okay. Uh, and then you will be able to develop movements. But again, see here, in a real knife fight, because of the distance, and because of the shortness of the weapon, you can deliver multiple thrusts in about one second. You can come in and hit five, six times in one second. And at that speed, the ability to parry, the ability to ward off and deliver a killing blow that will stop is very minimal it's either you keep on running away and you keep on stabbing at him or you are able to spin him around so that you can really come in and he's not unable to trust at you so there are techniques for when this guy is trusting behind him around him mm -hmm, when you're controlling him so it will take time and it has got to be dedicated and you have got to absorb all of the pain. We've had a few like that, soldiers, people who had to go out into the field. So Mung Romi, what uh, tips or advice would you give to someone starting out in um, Cavis Illustrissimo or FMA in general? Uh, look at the logic of the system. Any game, and fighting is the game, has a logic system. Just like you have a logic system in chess. You have a logic system in a Rubik's Cube. Okay? There is also a logic system in fighting with blades. Okay, now what game you want to play and what logic system it employs must fit reality. There, I, I saw a video of an African knife fighter, South African. He was excellent with his smoke and mirrors. Maybe, but it presupposes that the other guy goes down after you have hit him. Most guys can still move around after 27 stab wounds. Seen too many. Had the neighbor, he was carried out of the street into a jeepney. They rushed him to the hospital. A month later, I saw him back on the street. He had received 27 stab wounds. Okay, and in between, he was able to stick his knife into his opponent, who nearly died, who suffered worse than him. 
and he's not the only example. So if you're looking at survivability, yes, it pays to learn how to defend. But more than defending, you must know how to attack because people say the best defense is an offense, especially with knives. But I guess you don't carry a knife on you all the time. Or maybe in some places, if you carry the knife, you'll be in trouble with the police. And the truth is, you don't have time to draw your knife and open it. Yeah, that's another thing too. Unless, unless it's a street fight and both of you are shouting at each other, you have time to get your balisong, yes, time to get this balisong. And then you go and have it out with each other. And the more skilled guy is able to bring down the other. Yeah. And, you know, I would think most knife fights, it's not like a duel. You know, it comes from behind. You, you don't see it coming. It's, you know, you feel it before you even see it. It's not like in the <laughs> movies where they're, you know, dancing and like, nah. a, like a duel. It's. No, no. Almost always ambush. Yeah. So, uh, Mang Romi, where do you yes. see Kali Illustrisma going in the future um, with the next generation? It's not going anywhere. In my line, perhaps another generation. But the purity of it, the essence of it, the sheer efficiency of it, perhaps done in my gen in in the second generation after my senior student. After them, no more. Because it will be reinterpreted to them. It will be forgotten to them. Because they will not be using it. It's not going to be part of life. I'll tell you a story. The other Sunday, we were driving home, my son was driving, and there was this, I don't know if he was on high on marijuana or whatever. I don't, don't think he was drunk. But he was in the Mercedes, and he would overtake us and then stop, slow down in front of us. And he kept on doing this until finally my son decided to overtake on the right so that he could avoid him. And this guy simply tried to come in and and uh we finally hit him he finally hit us okay so we had to stop and there was talk my son went down i went down of course uh i i have a walking cane but on my right hip pocket i have a folder and i was standing beside behind my son and I had already opened my folder in my pocket so that in case it went physical, I would be able to push my son aside and I would go in. See, you need to have that kind of mindset. The awareness, the situational awareness. Yes, because this guy, you don't know. He might be crazy. Why would he do something like that? Three times that he did. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was looking for trouble. Maybe he was looking for a, a way out of his life. And he was going to use us. We don't know. I don't know if he had a knife, if he had a gun. So I was ready to jump in and knock him out. See? How many people can have that kind of mind? And how many of you will be allowed to walk around in your streets with a knife suitable for doing that? You get into trouble. It's more than 2.5, 2.75 inches. All right, yeah. So it's a different culture. It's a different situation. Me, if you want to keep it, you can keep it just like fencing. Olympic fencing, many elements of real dueling fencing are inside 
the three types of Olympic fencing. The more efficient are the EPE and the and the saber. The foil is for basics, but for real competitive fencing, then you can use the last two, EPE and saber. And right now they're coming back with the flat sabers, and the flat sabers are teaching. Uh, fencing in the old-fashioned way. The, I can recognize many of the techniques of illustration, especially in saber and then in epe. And they are efficient. And they are done at high speed because competitive. You're after the gold or you're after a flag. Okay. That should be enough for developing perception, skill, and the refinement of the few movements that are necessary to be able to be, make a touch. You want you want really good uh, training? You fence. My friends, I'm not being uh, unnationalistic, but I'm saying it as I see it. With the present way that FMA is trained, you give a foil to someone in FMA, they don't know. They, they'll swing it like a broom. There is no efficiency. And yet the old swordsmanship was like that. Albeit with the heavier blade, because before they were using heavier blades, but the efficiency of the movements are there. You look at the illustrissimo techniques, not the ones that you're seeing being bandied around. Take a look at Tatang's video. And that is done at one third speed, one fourth speed. Because those movements are similar in principle and in essence to that of sword fighting movements preserved in the Olympic style fencing. Of course, now Hema is coming back and reviving. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it will do, it will serve you well to take a look at some Hema formats. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, the Saber is one of the major influences on Kali's illustration. So if you see some good quality saber fencing, because there are still maybe three quarters of what's shown as, uh, I would call fancy. Okay, but some really good saber fencing, and you will see elements of Kali's illustration. The speed, the precision, the measure, the angling, and the delivery of strikes. Then use a stick because I make some of my students use a thin stick against a saber foil to be able to see how they test their measure because the stick is shorter than a foil and a foil is almost invisible because it is so thin. So they are able to employ their learned techniques against a foil because it can be done. That is a tip I'm giving to you. Open your minds. Don't just say, this is Filipino martial arts. We're using a stick. And, ah, no, I'm being nationalistic. No, be practical. You want to be good at it? Learn foil fencing, Olympic type, or some kind of HEMA saber work then you'll be able to understand your arnis better and you'll be able to understand oh this came from that oh this right. came from that yeah i totally agree with that you know just the um a lot of the influences that you know that came from spain and all the other you know blade blade arts you know take take what works you know and and apply it
there is something about blades and weapons. The Spaniards, <coughs> in general, use swords with about one meter length blades. On the average, 36 inches, thereabouts. The peoples that they invited, invaded, uh, the Moors, etc., etc., had swords that were about a third shorter. They fought the Moros, except for the Campilan, all other blades were shorter. Uh, they impressed upon the, the native Filipinos, the Indios. Uh, but the Indios fought back, and the Indios fought back with shorter blades, and they acquitted themselves quite well. Uh, you must understand that the sword has at least three parts. The weak, the middle, the strong. You have a shorter sword and you have the middle and the strong. If you know how to manage your measure, there is no inconvenience in having a shorter sword because you are employing your me your 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 middle, the, the forward half against his his uh, middle third. And you have the same leverage. Try it. Get a long stick, 36 inches. Get a shorter stick, 24 inches, after your hand. And you measure off. You can press against the middle of the longer sword with the forward fourth of your shorter sword. And be even. You can press with your strong against his middle and you are stronger. Because it's a question of leverages. Whether you are trying to wrestle each other like a Tai Chi or whether you are going to strike against the sword to throw it off. So again, it's applied engineering. And I have to tell you that the Europeans applied very good quality engineering. They took a look at geometry. They took a look at physics when they were developing their sword systems. That's why just a few Spaniards or just a few Europeans could defeat large numbers of native populations. We are so proud of our Moro tradition. And yet, for many years, the Spaniards with maybe 15 men, 20 men, would be able to stay off 400, 200, 300 Moros. Why? Because they had logical systems for fighting. Instead of being emotional and jumping all around and relying on athleticism, they relied on efficiency principles of efficiency and we're losing because we cannot see these principles of efficiency retained in our arnis because everybody likes to make uh, curly cues in the air all in the you know you know tatang had a term for this pang dalaga you know what a dalaga is Dalaga, no. Dalaga is a young woman, a young lady. So, Pang is for, for the young ladies. He meant it was movements that uh, a young man did in order to impress the young ladies. Yeah. Pang Dalaga. So, so uh, Mang... Romy, uh, is there anything you would like to promote or or, or cover anything we didn't, we didn't talk about? Uh, I will you know. I will offer this piece of advice. I'm not promoting the archive system of Tata. I'm keeping it away 
from people. Because people who will see one or two techniques will claim, oh, I saw that also in my grandfather. There are so many grandfathers now that they should have killed off all of the Spaniards. If all of them really knew their stuff. So, take a look at what is logical. Take a look at Hema as a reference. Okay. Take a look at what looks familiar in the movements of armies. And then perhaps uh, the Pangdalaga will move out of the picture and the Pang Away will come in. Away means fight. For a fight. Find out what will work. Where are more? Go hard at each other. But only one or two movements. An attack, a counter-attack, and a counter to the counter. Three movements. Pak, pak, pak. Stop. Who got the better of the other? Try it again. You have your techniques, you learn them, they say this will work, this will work. Okay, find out. Hard and fast. Let's see how the stick bounces. But when you simply do this and then do that and then do that, well, you can do that forever. No one's going to get hurt. Just wear headgear. Wear some gloves so that you, you will feel the force. My last piece of advice is this. We are very cerebral these days. And we imagine a lot of things. How I can do this and how I can do that. But remember, the imagination cannot move at the lightning speeds of a real fight. The imagination moves slowly because it must be able to register in the mind's eye the movement and then retain it and then make permutations of it. It cannot compensate for a real hard and fast physical encounter. Okay? If you do that, a lot of the superfluous movements will be eliminated. Only the very few that work will be seen and hopefully retained. I had a bypass seven years ago. After my bypass, my student said, Romy, uh, can we review? So we got equipment, got headgear, because we didn't use headgear before. So I have a lot of uh, scars mm. from blunts in the face. Okay. And okay, so we practiced. I said, let's do one technique after another. Let's test them. But we will test them as if we are trying to really go at each other. So we tested every single technique listed in Tatang's system work because they were efficient. They are efficient because they require less time to use. Because they make sense in the overall play when you are contending with each other. Took me three years to review him. And finally, I said, yeah, this is nice. But he's not satisfied. He wants to keep on testing. So that's the way to play. So for me, my advice is, Take a look. What is this? Pangdalaga? Fine. Uh, cultural. If you want to impress the girls, then, then go ahead. But yeah. otherwise. Uh -oh. uh, you want pangaway? Then wear gear and spar. Hard. Hard. Then you know, this works. This doesn't work. This really hurts. And there were times when we had to rest up for two weeks because we received injuries 
that needed us to stop. Uh, maybe I'm too, ano, too intense about this, but if you're doing anything, might as well do it properly. Yeah, against someone that's resisting you, not not a compliant partner all the time. You know what I mean? And you got to try it, see if it works for you. Yes. And, and body types, yeah. you know, something that might work for Jesse might not work for me, and vice versa. Yes. You know, and but you yes. just got to try it and <clears throat> see if it works for you. Yes, that's why you need to spar. Mm -hmm. If you have partners who are equally serious, then you spar round robin, so you don't get used to each other. Right. Mm. Fortunately, today there's protective equipment. In our time, there was no protective equipment. Hmm. So Tony and I would lose a fingernail every other week. <sighs> getting hit. We would be black and blue. Body and arms. Of course, we never struck at the head. Mm -hmm. But sometimes accidents happen. Okay. So we learn. And even now, this senior student of mine, he has some students of his own. And slowly he's taking off the gear, except the headgear. Because the more gear you have, the more armor, you know, it is it's a false sense of security also again. You know, so you, you would, I think people tend to be more uh, adventurous, you know, something that they normally wouldn't do if they didn't have any gear at all. You know, so. Yes. Uh, I would say foolish. Right, right. Not adventurous, foolish. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, that's why before before my surgery, we used to spar with blanks without any gear, without any protection. Of course, that was uh, a bit too uh, too intense. I could have lost an eye uh, or two. Yeah, especially Almost. when you're in the states, you'll get sued. Everyone will get sued. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So, yes, that's, uh, you know, look, um, I come from a different point of view. I don't like to teach. I will choose someone if I like him and also because I need a sparring partner. That's basically the main reason. And if I don't see him disciplined, I kick him out right away. I am not out to promote what we now call the archive system of college industry. I'm not out to sell. I keep on telling people because an issue came up about money. Said he paid you, then for he can do what he paid you for. He can do what he wants with what because he paid for it. I said no. It costs me money to teach. Why? My time. time. I take time away from my income generating activity i feed my students lunch and dinner i feed them snacks and some of them because filipinos are poor they don't have fair money i give them fair money so i have a disincentive to teaching unless i find a student teachable and he can learn and he's disciplined and is very very rare so i'm going to leave you with some of these advice injunctions and uh, no i'm not trying to promote anything because anytime anyone sees a technique then they'll say, hey, that's what my grandfather showed me before. They will not even be honest enough to say, oh, thank you, Mang Romy. That was a nice lesson that you gave. No. Because they are all the progenitors of their art. They are the sui generis of their art. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can, I can be, you know. I can be sarcastic at times. No. Anyway. Okay. Well, Mang Romi, thank you very much for taking time out to speak with us today. It was a great discussion. But I doubt that you can air any of this. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs>
you'll get into hot water. Oh no, no. You know, we want to put it out. You know, the the reality of it. Yeah. We just want everyone to be honest. Yeah. So. You know, because people will will you know, you have your good instruction and you have your crap instruction in any martial art, in any whatever. You know, yeah. and I think people need to to know this, the the realities of it. You know, and <clears throat> I mean, because we're not trying to be controversial, um, but you know, we you have to be honest with the people. So it's we just can't feed them half truths, right? So right. and then teach things that you know can get them killed. You yeah. know, and they they think that they they know enough to to protect themselves, where they're nowhere near it. You know, so people have to know that, and people will teach that. You know, just so they they make a they make money and. They'll try to make it look so fancy and sophisticated because it looks cool and very unpractical. Would never work in real life, you know. But then there's people that will eat that up, you know. Yes, uh, there's something lacking in present uh, FMA instruction. It is the sense of integrity in the instructor. They get overtaken by the need to become famous so that they can make more money or simply to become famous because their ego requires feeding. But there is no integrity and a sense of responsibility for what they are teaching and what it can do to their students. Those would be perhaps my parting words. For this. <laughs> okay. Well, Mang Romi, thank you again very thank much you. for taking the time out to, to talk to us. Rami, salamat din po. Thank you. Salamat po.